This is the first episode of our series titled Biblical Creation Basics. These videos will only be a few minutes long and will provide amazing evidence supporting biblical creation that anybody can utilize in conversations, debates, discussions, and more. This episode will focus on how the Genesis flood best explains the geology of the earth. Present processes cannot explain what we see in terms of the earth's geology. What we actually see points to catastrophic processes in the past. What type of catastrophic event could best explain what we see? The Bible speaks of a flood. This flood is clearly worldwide as it says that all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. According to the scriptures, only Noah and his family survived. The biggest reason people would even attempt to challenge a global flood is because they know you cannot have both millions of years and a global flood. A main line of evidence for an old earth is fossils billions of fossils. They would assert these fossils had been deposited over millions of years. A global flood would deposit most of these fossils in one giant flood. We know these fossils are continent wide. The sediments cover entire continents. In an older creation model, a global flood would destroy the fossil record. You cannot have deep time and a global flood. Unfortunately, many Christians have chosen to reject the plain reading of scripture, and they have decided to put forth a local flood instead. Jesus compares the coming judgment by fire to the days of Noah. The coming judgment would be a global judgment, of course, in the same way that the flood of Noah was a global and worldwide event. It would not make any sense for the flood of Noah to be a localized event in the same way that the coming judgment by fire would be localized. Why would Noah build a massive ark, take two of every kind of animal, including birds, if it were indeed a local flood? Even a continent-wide flood would not make any sense. Noah had 100 years to build the ark. He could have moved anywhere in 100 years. This is why the flood was clearly global. Because that is exactly why an ark was required in the first place. The flood itself is proof that the majority is oftentimes wrong. Only eight people survived the flood of Noah. The majority was wrong in those days. There is overwhelming evidence that the entire earth was once underwater. We find marine fossils on mountains and in landlocked areas that are far from any body of water. All you have to do is look at the sedimentary layers that extend across entire continents. The deposition of these layers must have been catastrophic. This catastrophic cause must have been global in order to explain these incredibly massive layers extending entire continents. This all had to have formed rapidly. If these layers were not formed rapidly, we would not have billions of fossils in the first place. Fossilization is an exceedingly rare event and requires extremely specific conditions. To get a fossil in the first place, you have to bury it quickly and deeply. Because if an organism is not buried quickly and deeply, you will get scavengers who will eat the organism, or the organism will bloat and float, never actually becoming a fossil. It would fall apart and disintegrate. The worldwide flood of Noah, the global flood with the immense and unique consequences have incredible explanatory power when it comes to the geological features of the earth, as well as in explaining the world's coal oil, mountain ranges, fossils, canyons, and more. Starting from the biblical creation position, 
results in some fascinating testable predictions. For example, the biblical creation model has predicted that the vast majority of DNA sequences and DNA elements are functional. Why would God create genomes of junk? We would expect genomes of treasure. It turns out that we have preliminary evidence for genome-wide functionality in humans. If most of the genome really did consist of useless genetic baggage, then this may be a contradiction to the design hypothesis. Biblical creationists have always predicted that we would discover important functions for non-coding DNA. Proponents of evolution arguing against biblical creation have been guilty of materialism of the gaps with their line of reasoning and argumentation. Their assumption that most of the genome was junk has always been based on an evolutionary starting point. Evolutionists require neutral junk in order that the high mutation rate could be counterbalanced by the junk portions of the genome. Mutations could be absorbed by the junk areas of genomes, making them absolutely neutral and therefore not degenerating to genetic functionality. In 2012, the ENCODE project came out with amazing results, suggesting that upwards of 80% of the human genome was active to some extent. They discovered significant detectable biochemical function. We know that the vast majority of our genome is incredible evidence for biochemical function. Evolutionists would assert that this activity is mostly spurious or simply genetic noise. But if this activity was not useful or the transcription was simply spurious, then natural selection should have weeded out this genetic baggage millions of years ago. This would be incredibly wasteful of resources and energy for the cell. This is a strong indication that this activity is in fact useful and beneficial. We also know that ERVs and other classes of retrotransposons accomplish many crucial functions in regulating gene expression, cell differentiation, development, and even cell stress responses. Do evolutionists have any real empirical evidence that actually demonstrates a non-functional DNA element such as an ERV going from non-functional to something critically functional in the genome? The answer is no, they don't. Even pseudogenes have now been shown to harbor incredibly important functional roles that are necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the cell. We now know that junk DNA is junk science. Global flood deniers, or as 2 Peter 3 puts it, the scoffers, assert that there is absolutely no evidence for a worldwide flood. This demonstrates just how willingly ignorant they are. The evidence is all around us. Before I get into some of this fascinating evidence for the Genesis flood, make sure to check out Biblical Creation Basics Episode 1, The Genesis Flood. In that episode, we discussed how sedimentary layers that extend it across entire continents are testimony to Noah's flood. The cause of these sedimentary layers must be global in order to explain these incredibly massive layers extending entire continents. We also know that deep time cannot explain the existence of billions of fossils worldwide. No a process best explains the existence of fossils. This is a catastrophic process that results in rapid burial. There are fossils of animals giving birth. There are fossils of fish being eaten. And we see massive dinosaur graveyards where we know this must have occurred quickly through catastrophic means. 
What about fossilized footprints? Fossilized footprints indicate that very little time has passed before the next layer was laid down in order to get the fossilized footprints to begin with. The evidence for the flood is amazing. Everywhere we look, there is abundant evidence from geology that the flood really did occur. Nothing in the fossils support deep time evolution and slow geological processes. What the fossil record supports is massive death and burial on a global scale. What else do we see around the world that corroborates the Genesis flood? We see rapid or no erosion between sedimentary layers. We see flat featureless boundaries. We find whole rock layer sequences deposited rapidly in quick succession. The Bible tells us that at the beginning of the flood, all of the fountains of the great deep were broken for. This is actually a major problem for local flood proponents and Bible compromisers. The deep, which is the Hebrew word to home, connects back to creation. The creation event tells us that there was one ocean covering the whole world before the land was formed. Did the Bible only say that the fountains of the great deep broke forth? No. The Bible tells us that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. This would suggest that most of the water of the flood came from below the earth's crust in subterranean chambers circling the entire planet. Since the Bible clearly tells us that the fountains of the great deep broke open, we can then make testable predictions as a way to actually test whether this really did occur just thousands of years ago. These fountains erupted in such a way that the original crust of the earth, due to the tremendous force, would have been cracked or fractured like an eggshell. Do we find evidence for this? The answer is an astounding yes. We find exactly what would be expected with the mid-oceanic ridge. This is very well known in the Atlantic Ridge. If you follow this around the, the entire globe, much like a seam on a baseball, you find that this can best be explained by the original fracturing of the earth during the bursting of the fountains of the Great Deep. How about testable predictions? We know that the gold standard of science is to make testable and falsifiable predictions. Well, PhD flood geologists have done just this. In some of the global flood models, we have what is called runaway subduction. This is where one tectonic plate goes beneath the other. If this were done over millions of years, a subducted plate down under the earth would have warmed up to the surrounding mantle rock. Today, we observe snail paced movements of the plates. The continents are moving very slowly. The catastrophic processes during the flood can explain what today's snail-paced geological movements cannot. At the time of the flood, we would have had meters per second movements of the plates through the flood waters. We would no longer be looking at continental drift. It would have been continental sprint. It turned out that a prediction based on many of these starting points was confirmed in the most amazing way. If this runaway subduction had only occurred just thousands of years ago during the flood, we should find evidence of this in the earth. And we have discovered this exact evidence. We have discovered huge slabs of cold rock at the base of the mantle, indicating that they had not yet had time to warm up to the surrounding materials. This is yet again huge confirmation of the Genesis flood. Remember, 2 Peter 3 tells us, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. 
that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Welcome to Biblical Creation Basics, Episode 4, Created Heterozygosity. This episode discusses the design diversity hypothesis or the created heterozygosity hypothesis. Heterozygosity simply means a state of DNA diversity. This model would suggest that the original created kinds, including Adam and Eve, would have been created with design diversity. God would have front-loaded them with functional DNA differences. This would give the original kinds the capacity to change and adapt to new environments. There exists a major difference between the biblical creation model and the deep time evolutionary model when it comes to explaining the origin of genetic diversity. Evolutionists would explain the origin of most or all genetic variation as being the result of mutation, while the biblical creationists would explain most genetic variation as being the result of initial design. God would have front-loaded kinds of creatures with created nuclear heterozygosity, or in other words, built-in diversity. This one basic difference has massive implications in terms of explaining the origin of today's varieties and species. These front-loaded DNA differences could easily translate into an enormous amount of visible change and variety. And this could be done simply through genetic processes such as recombination and gene conversion. In sexually reproducing organisms, there exists a scrambling of DNA each generation. This means the built-in alternatives will be scrambled over time, leading to incredible change. This model actually makes some very amazing predictions on DNA function. The trajectory of discovery strongly favors genome-wide functionality and thus fulfilling and meeting these predictions. It is an astounding thing to consider that with simple heterozygosity, incredible variation can be produced. Even today, a husband and a wife can produce incredible variety in a single generation. This is because we have built-in genetic diversity today. Therefore, Adam and Eve, thousands of years ago, with DNA differences between them and also within them, can it easily explain the ethno-linguistic differences we see today. In fact, this model effortlessly explains the number of species on the planet today. Created organisms with designed internal diversity do not need mutations to generate today's diversity. As a matter of fact, this internal diversity will lead to rapid change quickly. Since the genetic variation is already built in from the start, processes such as natural selection, recombination, and gene conversion can convert this diversity into change instantly. In a nutshell, with heterozygous ancestors, a substantial range of combinations of chromosomes, genes, and traits will be probable. An incredible amount of a morphological adaptability can be derived 
from the original created archetypes. In future videos, we will get into the many more amazing ways God created organisms to change and change rapidly. This is Biblical Creation Basics, Episode 5, The Mother of All Living. The Bible claims to be the history book of the universe. The Bible is extremely clear when it comes to human origins. Genesis 1, 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Jesus Christ himself in Mark 10, 6 said, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. God created the first two humans, Adam and and Eve just thousands of years ago. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And Genesis 3.20 says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. The Bible tells us that man was specially created and did not come about through evolutionary processes. Humans are an independent creation made in the image of God and are not related to any other form of life, including the great apes. If the Bible's claim of human origins is indeed true, we should be able to test its claims to the empirical scientific data. We have actually discovered our first couple in our genetics. We have two amazing DNA sections known as the uni parentally inherited DNA compartments. These important pieces of DNA can answer this question of ancestry and tell us whether the Bible's account of human origins is true or not. Our mitochondrial DNA is the non-recombining DNA compartment that we only get from our mothers. And the Y chromosome, another non-recombining piece of DNA we only get from our fathers. In the process of creating sperm and egg cells, chromosomes line up and exchange genetic information. This is recombination. What this means is that offspring will have differing combinations of genes on each of its chromosomes than its parents had. This is an important way to generate genetic variety. In this episode, we will focus primarily on the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA does not have a partner to recombine with. This is why these unique pieces of DNA, the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, get passed on nearly unchanged from generation to generation. We will focus on the details of the Y chromosome in a future episode. The mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome give us a way to look deep into the past and answer the important question of ancestry. Those that hold to deep time evolution and reject a biblical creation model of ancestry have based their dates off of indirect lines of evidence. They use the assumption-based method, and as a result, end up calibrating the data. The molecular clock, which we've mentioned before, is based on the idea that mutations occur in empty DNA at a pretty regular rate. But since that rate of change isn't the same across all of humanity, the clock needs to be calibrated. The clock needs to be calibrated. The clock needs to be calibrated. 
the other non-recombining stretch of DNA, the Y chromosome. And when it comes to how far back this Y chromosome goes, the latest molecular clock calibrations, 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 they assume common ancestry. They assume human evolution is true. And they assume deep time. And then they calibrate the data with the assumptions of their paradigm. They will say mitochondrial Eve lived about 200,000 years ago in Africa. This is based off of geology and archaeology, indirect lines of evidence. They are not necessarily determining this answer based off direct genetic evidence. We can measure how quickly DNA changes or mutates over time. For example, if we were to look at my DNA and my kid's DNA, or my DNA and my parents' DNA, we would see genetic differences. Mistakes happen from generation to generation. In mitochondrial DNA, mistakes occur. And when we measure the rate of this change, we find that it is fast. A lot faster than secular evolutionists would have expected or predicted. We can take grandmothers and granddaughters, or we can even take two ladies who we know share a common great, great, great grandmother in the distant past. We can look at their DNA sequences, their mitochondrial DNA sequences. And by comparing them, we can determine a mutation rate. This is through straightforward and empirical means. The answer we have is very much inconsistent with deep time evolution and universal common ancestry. The rate is far too fast, as has been indicated. The number of DNA differences and also the mutation rate itself fits perfectly with the biblical model of ancestry. The data that we have for this specific uniparentally inherited DNA compartment has actually led to an active research program in determining the history of civilization and even making novel testable predictions on mutation rates in people groups whose rates have not yet been measured. And the results have been fascinating. These amazing results have been possible simply because the reality is that the history of humanity only goes back 6,000 years. There did not have to be evidence for one female ancestor of all people on the planet today. Eve, the mother of us all, has a unique piece of DNA that is exactly what we would expect if the Genesis account of human origins were true. There was every conceivable reason to have learned that this unique piece of DNA this mitochondrial DNA ancestor was not so unique. This mitochondrial DNA ancestor could have shared many lines with chimpanzees if we really did share relationship with them. If human evolution were true and humans were indeed related to the great apes, this should have been reflective in the mitochondrial DNA. Biblical Creation Basics, Episode 6, Y Chromosome, Noah. The best evidence for the biblical model of ancestry and the special creation of Adam and Eve, the first couple, is in our genetics. Episode 5 of Biblical Creation Basics, the mother of us all focused primarily on mitochondrial Eve. There exists overwhelming evidence for the one woman of whom we have all descended from. The one female ancestor of all people on the planet today. What we know about the mitochondrial DNA is exactly what we would expect 
if the Genesis account of human origins were true. There is no disputing the fact that there is one single mitochondrial DNA ancestor and one single Y chromosomal DNA ancestor of all people today. This episode will focus primarily on Y chromosome Noah. The Bible in Genesis 1.26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Genesis 2.7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ made it clear that Adam and Eve were the first two people created just thousands of years ago. Mark 10, 6 says, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. There exists a unique piece of DNA called the Y chromosome. This DNA compartment is unique in the same way as the mitochondrial DNA, as it is also uniparentally inherited DNA. It is also non-recombining. We get this piece of DNA, the Y chromosome, from our fathers, if we are male. This piece of important DNA is passed on unbroken from father to son. Every single male Y chromosome is nearly identical. There is extremely low genetic variation in the male Y chromosome. And every single Y chromosome in the world can be traced back to one single Y chromosomal ancestor in the not so distant past. From time to time, a mistake occurs. And every time this transpires, a new branch in the family tree is generated. This is where we can examine all the branches in the world and determine that they go back to a single person. This single person is not a chimpanzee, it is a man. And this man lived a few thousand years ago. Who is this? Evolutionists have coined our last Y chromosomal ancestor, Y chromosome Adam. But in fact, it is Y chromosome Noah. Since we now know the Y chromosome mutates fast, a lot faster than the evolutionary community has ever predicted, there ends up being, on average, three mutations per generation. And there ends up only being a few hundred mutations separating people worldwide. Then, our last Y chromosomal ancestor, Noah, existed just 4,500 years ago. This is all inconsistent with human evolution and common ancestry. The human Y chromosome is also very different from the chimpanzee Y chromosome. There are massive size differences between the human and the chimpanzee Y chromosomes, as well as major differences in architecture and gene content. Again, this was not expected by the evolutionary community. As we have seen, one of the best lines of evidence for the first couple, Adam and Eve, is in our genetics. Both mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Noah have been discovered by modern science. Our actual common ancestor probably lived as early as 5,000 to 10,000 years ago. All this shows that we are so closely related, more so than we could ever imagine. There is no disputing the fact that there is one single Y chromosome ancestor and one mitochondrial DNA ancestor. This is exactly 
what the Bible has predicted. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Biblical Creation Moments. If you are not yet subscribed, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. And please share around this content as the truth is so important. God bless. As a quick reminder to everyone, hit that like button. It actually does help. Team Standing for Truth is out.